Hello and welcome to another episode of Mysteries with a History, where I'll take you on the wild ride into the unknown, the strange, and the mysterious. Like you, I have questions, and like you, I want answers. There's more to this world than most think or believe. Mysteries that stretch back into murky epochs of time, that hint of other realms, other worlds, and other intelligences. We're on this journey together. With each episode, we will peel away the layers to look for the truth. Hello to everyone in the live chat. Are you ready for today? Because Peru has a rich history steeped in ancient traditions, lost civilizations, mysterious land art, relic city ruins, mystical artifacts, UFO sightings, and much more. From tourist hot spots like the gigantic ancient land drawings known as the Nazca Lines of the Desert Plains of Nazca to the stone structures of Sacsayhuaman to the 11,000 feet high city ruins in the clouds of Machu Picchu to even more mysterious sites like the alleged portal in the rock known as the Gate of the Gods in Hay Hayumarca near the equally fantastic and mystical Lake Titicaca. Peru is a country that speaks of epochs of lost time and lost knowledge. It's also incredibly beautiful and completely mysterious. To help me uncover some fascinating stories and locations, let me bring in my co-host, Jimmy Church of Fade to Black Radio. Jimmy, how's it going? Are you going to mute the mic again? Uh, yeah, I do that just to... And lo- oh, I've got mysterious lighting going on today. It Look looks good. That. I like it. Yeah, I didn't light up the studio. So this is, this is, this is, this is natural. Another great topic, uh, Christina. I, 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 Peru's loaded. Oh, and it's so stunning. It's it's loaded. It's got a it's got all the good stuff. It's uh yeah, it's like th- three thousand varieties of potatoes. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I think um doesn't uh, empanadas aren't those aren't those from Peru? Those are Argentinian, which are delicious. Really? See, I and thought- also other parts of South America. I think that most parts of South America have their own version of empanadas, but my favorite are the ones from Argentina. Okay, I'm I'm thinking Peru, but when I when I lived down there, um, it, I'm not making this up. So it's like my first day at school, uh, junior high school. Go to the cafeteria, right? And they have machines. Right, it's not a cafeteria line, right? There might have been, I don't remember, but anyway, it was the machines. And I'm watching what everybody's doing, and they're going up and they're getting out empanadas, right? And they're just rows and everything. But I thought they were like hostess apple pies, right? I was like, oh, this is cool, you know, apple pies for lunch. So, anyway, um, somebody says, no, those are empanadas, epa, what. And they, anyway, the first bite, right? Now, I was introduced to the Central American Panamanian version of it. But finding out down there, um, I think everybody had told me it was it was Peruvian. But it's beside the point. It, it, it was a gift from the baby Jesus, right? You, you bite into that. And it's every variety that you can think of, you know, potatoes, so meat. Good. And and wow, wow, just incredible. So anyway, um, how did we get off on? We always get, uh, discuss food, but um, doesn't and, bother me. But anyway, Peru is kind of like the South American version of like Utah, right? Where it, it's kind a, of. yeah, yeah, a little bit of everything is going on down there. And I was first introduced uh, to. Uh, Peru, like most of us, through Eric Von Daniken and the Nazca Lines and Chariots of the Gods and the documentary and and seeing the Nazca Lines and the TV commercials and and, and then going to go see the movie. Um, that was that was it for me. Uh, what movie? Uh, uh, Chariots of the Gods. Oh, okay. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a documentary that uh, maybe you should check out someday. It's uh, 
it, it it's the most important documentary ever made. I still watch it. Uh, 1971, I think it came out. I, I pop that thing in about once a month. Um, it's just it's just timeless. Well, well, anyway, so Peru for me personally was just the gift that uh, kept on giving, and it still does. Um, all the way through to today, where we've got the Nazca mummies, and uh, one one other brief comment: there are uh, the areas you just brought up, Lake Titicaca, right? Right. Well, that's on the border, and so just a few miles across the border there into Bolivia, you have Puma Punku. Um, if you go south into Chile, you have right there uh, the Atacama Desert. And the Atacama mummy, and and you know it's that area. It's, it's something is just e- extraordinarily mysterious about that entire area. So uh, I'm very excited. So much to talk about. I've I've collected some things, and uh, I'm I'm just excited. So um, this is where I always ask the same question. You know, at this point, what made you go in this direction for this week's show? I woke up Wednesday morning and I said, hmm, mysteries of Peru. And then and then that's how it happened. It was that up. simple. It, it was that, that simple. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I can. Some, um, sometimes it just kind of hits you like a ton of rocks. Other times you got to look for it. Sometimes you get inspired. Well, true, true. And you do. It's not just if, if you think about it. Um, it's not just uh, Peru or Chile or Argentina. You've got Easter Island, you know, out there right. uh, uh, to the west. Um, and then it, you've got, of course, Brazil. Uh, then you've got Venezuela. You've got Colombia. The Colombian artifacts that I'm always wearing on my lapels. Uh, then you go into Panama and head up Costa Rica, Honduras, uh, Belize, Guatemala, um, uh, the Mayans and the temples and everything that went through that era. It is just an amazing uh, part of the world. It is truly beautiful. And before we get started, Michael, thank you so much. It says this topic is an early B-Day present. Happy birthday, 56 tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Do you believe the Nazca lines are older than recorded? Well, we're going to get into that. That's, I mean, we have to talk about the Nazca lines when we bring up Peru. So that's a great question. And happy birthday once again. Yeah, and yeah. then, well, Michael, anybody will do anything to get a birthday shout out. So there happy you go. Birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. Happy birthday, Michael. And Jessica, thank you. As always, it says great topic. And I hope everyone likes this topic. I mean, you can never go wrong with peru they have amazing food they have uh, seriously a crazy amount of varieties of potatoes and corn wow yeah. that that is enough for me to move <laughs> it, 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 here okay all right one last comment about food well, just just one when i went uh to live in that area and i was there for three years um, and I, you go from the United States and shopping malls and y- 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 you know what I mean? Fast food and everything that we do up here. That's great. And nothing. I, I love it. But when you go to another country like that and you get into the culture and it's the things like epinadas or ceviche and the local plantains, I never had them plantains before. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Never. Never and 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 down there they're sold in bags like potato chips. They're everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. So fresh when they're soft and crunchy on the outside, with a little salt on the top. I mean, there's just nothing like. Anyway, um, I really got in to the food culture um, that is down there. And in Panama, you have a little bit of Caribbean. You've got those influences, of course, crazy seafood, but all of the South American influences. Um, and no tacos, no burritos. I don't remember anything. Well, maybe. Um, I, I don't remember a whole lot of that. But it was everything um, from uh, Central and South America that, that was just, and it, it really changed me. It, it really did. It really did. <laughs> Changes you on a spiritual level. South American food, not from Central America, but from South America. Wow. I mean, it it hits different. So let's get into the topic before we get even more sidetrack on food, which I, literally I could do all day, every day. But I have to bring up the word ramen if food is mentioned, even though that's not a thing there. 
we have to somehow incorporate it in. So I just did. Now let's get started. Let's go. I want to first talk about the Inca language. This blew my mind. And I'm going to share my screen here of uh, what we're looking at because it's bizarre. And you know, we're, right now we're looking at string. This is their language. This is how they were able to communicate very complex mathematical data and um, stories as well with string. Now, so let me I, go I, I've, I've heard about this. And so they tie knots in the string, right? And the right. strings are in order and, mm -hmm. and the knots are there. And then that's encoded. And then you have to decode it. Yeah, isn't that? It's unreal. <laughs> so pretty much... Um, the knotted lengths of cord are made from cotton, llama, or alpaca wool. And they hung them in rows from a thicker cord. And just like what they were able to, they were able to communicate very complex mathematical data and narrative information. And after more than a century of studying this language, Researchers have managed to fully crack the code of the mathematical data, but they still haven't been able to fully understand the narratives or the stories they were trying to communicate with uh, this type of string. And this is the only culture that I've come across so far that doesn't use pictograms, that doesn't use anything written. I mean, nothing nothing like this and and, and what's what and what's an, an interesting here is uh the mayan uh culture which was you know way north and um uh you know on the other side of panama um had a fully engaged written language and down in south america they did not there's there's nothing written and when we talk about well we'll get into machu picchu here in a second um, still don't know the dating on that. We'll, we'll talk about that when we get to it, everybody. But there is nothing written. The Incas didn't have it. So there is nothing written about uh, the, wall, the, <laughs> the buildings, the location, their uses, what, what was going on there, who built them. Uh, nothing. There isn't a written language uh, for the Incas. But but this is incredible. Uh, I'm so glad Um you have and each knot is different uh yeah, yeah this, if you look at it yeah yeah incredible you know and i've heard about this over the years i've seen different examples of it um and it just got away from me you're absolutely right and i'm glad that uh, you're showing this to everybody today and it makes me question do the different colors also affect the language as well i wasn't able to find that in my research but looking at this photo we are seeing different color strings and I feel like it would only be appropriate that it had a meaning to them. Yeah, yeah. Times 10, times 100, right? Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. Well done. Oh, thank you. I have to do research for the show, right? I got to work hard and figure things out because this this was new to me. Uh, once again, I've never heard anything like that in my research. And as you know, Jimmy, and those that have that are a part of this audience that have been for quite some time. Every single show that we do, I practically go in blind. I know nothing about it best until way best it's way the best to way to do it. So when I was looking at Peru, other than the Nazca lines and a little bit about Machu Picchu and then a little bit about Lake uh, um, Titicaca, which we've talked about, aside from those really main things, Peru was... I knew nothing that much about it, honestly. So I feel like doing these types of shows, not only for myself, but also for all the newcomers, they can learn with us. And then I can also hear the stories that we have to say and the research that's been collected over the decades. Uh, where are we going to start first? I'll let you pick. I'll let, I'll let you pick. Uh, man, do we... Uh, you know what? Let's let's start with. Uh, I was going to say Machu Picchu. Uh, let's swing back around to that. Um, let's go with Nazca because there's a few things in Nazca. It's not just the Nazca lines, but but let's start there because for me that was the beginning of my journey um, and so much more. The book is not closed on on Nazca. Far from it. Um, uh, new things are being discovered every day. So, we'll, and we'll talk about that and some of the new things uh, that that uh, have been found there. You know what I did? You know what I saw today? I saw some satellite images of Nazca. 
Hmm. which you can see from space. I, I didn't include that. I was going to pull it over. Um, but anyway, when, when we get into the a, 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 a ancient astronaut theory uh, part of this and Eric Von Daniken and some, and I, I'll pop up a couple images here in a second, you can clearly see, I'll show it in a second, from space. So could, they, could that have been, I know it's woo, but could that have been a marker for for something in space or a runway or a landing site and then you scratch your head on that and then you look at the satellite image and you're like well uh, makes sense to me because there it is okay so here we are here's a set of uh the nazca lines go ahead christina so the Nazca lines can really only be viewed from the air. And the mounds have been dated back to at least 3,500 BCE. And what's very interesting about this is that they weren't really discovered until after the airplane came. And that was in Peru about 1927, where investigations really got started on attempting to decipher these Nazca lines because if you look at them up close you have no idea what you're looking at but when you get an aerial view you're seeing all of these different animals here we got a monkey we got a person we got different types of birds here's a an ant no that's a well. tarantula that's a tarantula <laughs> big and scary it is. but i think i think my favorite one is the cat because cats have a very special place in my heart and look okay. how adorable that is absolutely now stop right there let's stop at this image this wasn't discovered until 2019 that's right and when this discovery was made and uh there are a lot of international uh, archaeologists uh, that are there every day uh, mapping out and and now with drone technology um they have found uh over uh 100 new figures since uh, 2020 uh, that number today is about 147 and they are using words like it's not going to stop, right? There is so much more to find. It, and they're not saying unlimited but or infinite, but that's kind of where it is today. Anyway, so this cat was on the side of this hill overlooking the Nazca lines this entire time, and it was just so big that nobody, you know what I mean? It, it, it didn't stick out. And then it was discovered, and... And, and photographed and, and, and imaged uh, with different types of uh, cameras and lenses. And there it was, this, the cat is lying on its side, right? Kicking back, right? Uh, relaxing on the side of this hill. And it's incredible. I like his back legs and his front paws. He's just lying on his side saying, what's up? I love it. It's great. It looks, uh, I, I like the way Hydes said it. It looks like a kid did the cat and it, it does, and I think that's why it's so adorable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 2019, though, right? And now you mentioned uh, the mounds that are there. In this area, it's not just the Nazca Lines. There are pyramids. Uh, the Nazca Lines themselves with radiocarbon dating, uh, they've, they've narrowed it down to about uh, 500 B.C., um, and then, strangely enough, uh, abandoned uh, about 1,000 years later. Uh, right. The construction just stopped. But but here's the trippy thing. In 1909, when some of the first researchers and explorers started to arrive in this area, they, they didn't know, right? They didn't see it from the air. They thought they were paths, literally paths, walking paths. So they're, they're wide. <laughs> they thought they were going somewhere, uh, you know, walking in circles. Can you imagine walking on the, uh, the monkey's tail? wondering where it's going to take you, and obviously it just takes you to the center of the tail. But that's what it, they thought. They thought that these were just paths uh, that were carved into the desert. And here's the other curious thing. Uh, this is from memory, everybody, if I'm wrong. Uh, you, but this is how they were made. They went to where they were going to you know, uh, put a line down, and they removed any discolored rocks That's right. and, and put those to the side and left the discolored portion in the middle of the soil. And, and that's how these, they, these aren't painted. 
it was done by removing a different color from that. And just think about how how painstaking and and how labor intensive. And it's in the desert. It's the desert, in the high desert. Uh, at that, no water, nothing there. And uh, but that's how that's how these were uh, done, and that's how they've withstood time. You know, for uh, over two thousand years now. And the desert is is a key word. If this was anywhere else, the wind and erosion would have taken away these uh, geoglyphs. But because we're dealing with a desert that has just minimal, minimal rain and very little wind and erosion, they've been able to stay for 2,000 years or so. And it probably will be for another 2,000 years. So it is it is rather exciting. I do hope that we get more information on this because for the most part, it's still elusive. Researchers really aren't sure why why these were created. Now, I'm going to pop something up. You may have this already, Christina, uh, but I'm going to pop something up on the screen. And if you could. That's our signal, remember? Okay, there right. we go. I have no idea, remember. I was thinking, is he going to give the secret. signal? That's our secret. Okay, so this image here, um, this is what you can see from space uh, that I saw in the satellite images. Um, now, I want everybody to take a close look, and you have to think about the population and how many people were there. This is a mountaintop that was leveled. Okay, there was a mountain here. And they leveled it off. Now, you can see the edge. Here, let me get my pointer over here. This is the edge of, and they, from here to here, is leveled off. This was a mountaintop that went like this, right? And, and, both, and they removed all of the dirt and rock and leveled it out and then carved these areas. Now, these, this is kilometers long. I mean, this is just extraordinary. So it's so big, you can see it from space. The satellite images of this area, you just look and it's it, it's right there. So um, think about how much it's one thing to talk about, you know, the tarantula and the monkey and the hummingbird, but to level off this mountaintop and then put this in it, which you can't see unless you're up in the air. What was the purpose for this? And without going fully woo, Okay, that's there. That's interesting that you could only see it from the sky, but how much effort do you have to put in to remove the top of a mountain, level it completely flat, and then place these? What looks like a, a modern airport? Uh, that's the way it appears to me, and I don't think Eric von Daniken is too far off from uh, his original research. But I just find that absolutely extraordinary. Extraordinary. It's also bizarre. If if we look 2,000 years ago, like you had mentioned, what would be the reason to create something like that? And they're going to be using very simplistic tools, if not practically doing everything by hand. So there would have to be a significant reason to do that or even to volunteer or even to be forced to do something like that. Could it could it have been for a ritualistic reason, a holy reason? Do you think they were asked to do so by some extraterrestrial uh, civilization? Because the Incas did did not have any written language, so much of their history has been lost, and it's incredibly unfortunate. Yeah, and, and now uh, again, um, you you bring up a, a great point. And so that's why I need to show everybody this. Now, this one's cute too. It, it, that if that doesn't look ET ish, like Steven Spielberg, the movie ET, I don't know what does. And now this is it's huge. By the way, you can see the erosion. At, on the bottom of the mountain right here. You can see how big it is. Um, but I've, I've seen the outline drawings of this. You can clearly see the head and the eyes. There's an arm here, and, there's, and it looks like some kind of robe uh, because there's a line that comes down here. You see the two feet. Um, but it, it, 
it just doesn't look human to me. And I'm not sure what's going on, but that is that is pretty crazy right there. So is it contact? Is it some kind of proof of something? I don't know, but they were trying to show us uh, something here. And that geoglyph is dubbed the astronaut. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, mm. yep, 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 yep. Thank uh, you, Deranged. I- Actually, uh, one of my uh, favorite images uh, from there. And then uh, I want to uh, show this because I was talking about this last night on the show. Um, But uh, I got to tell everybody this. uh, Okay, what am I? Question. Did they know this would come off as super cute? I know, right? (laughs) Okay, okay. So, well, what about this right that is super uber cute and obviously a hummingbird right now you you cannot uh when you look at this image that's a road out here so mm-hmm. just imagine a car you know driving down that road you can sort of see structures in here uh, right you know a little building here that's how big this is and look how amazing those lines are. Now, there are some uh, researchers out there. And again, I love thinking outside of the box. Okay. Have to. There are some researchers out there that have gone and, and done a deeper dive that everything here is placed uh, for a reason and that they have lined this up with star maps where there are constellations where uh that line up with each one of these tips of the the feathers um the claws on the feet uh the end of the beak where that is um i think there's a a a star that shows up where the eye should be on the hummingbird and you go and you look and so uh, there are um uh, with some of the other images, and not every single one uh, at NASCA, that there are literally hundreds of them, but these constellations do line up. Um, there are, you know, and there's one specifically uh, of of a bird that has uh, all eight or nine planets with our sun and our solar system in it with a a, a strange alignment. Could it be? Well, let's just remember, you cannot see this except from the air. That's right. So it was there uh, was there the ability to fly? I'm talking about the culture in Peru, the Nazca culture. Um, did they have balloons? Let's just talk about earthly things, right? Did they have an ability to fly? Did they have a way to get up in the air? Or were they taking a ride on somebody else's craft to go up there and and work on these designs? Did they have somebody up above them giving them instructions? Were they projected onto the desert floor and then traced? You know, you have to think about all of these different because they didn't do it from the ground. Right? There's they, no way. There's no way. You couldn't, you could, it's just impossible. So how did it get done? And it's just, it's one of those extraordinary places on planet Earth. Uh, another one of many in Peru that I just find so fascinating, Christina. Nature Cam HD asks, have there been UAP sightings over the Nazca lines? What do you know about that? There, uh, you can go. Uh, yes. Okay. So the the and thank you. By the way, thank yeah. You. The short answer is uh, all the time. They have UFO tours. They have groups. Uh, we're going to talk about Rama here in a minute, yeah, and great. and and what they do down there. And you can absolutely go and do a sky watch tour and and go see uh, some extraordinary things. So the answer is yes. Every day, every night. What blew my mind, because again, I am new. I am. uh... Anyways, I found out that Peru even had their own UFO office. Yes. Back in 2013, started in 2001. It had a five-year hiatus. 
And then in 2013, it blew up over the internet, but no one ever talks about it. And so mm-hmm. it was it was news to me when I found that out yesterday. Yeah. Chile, Argentina, uh, Brazil, uh, Peru. Um, I don't know about Venezuela or Colombia, but certainly Argentina, Chile, Peru. Yes, there it is. Uh, Brazil um, are all active uh, government uh, uh, programs that that take the UFO subject very, very seriously. And for quite some time, and it makes me think, what took the United States so long to make theirs public? And why is everyone staring at the U.S. when all these other countries have been doing it forever? You know, I remember uh, uh, asking Leslie Kane about that. And, it, you know, you, she's got all of these images of her meeting with uh, military and government officials all over South America. I said, what, what, what gives? She goes, they take it serious. I walk into these rooms. I'm talking about generals. You know, the military, the Air Force, the Navy, everybody is there. The government is represented and they take it very, very serious. And I and she can't explain it. It's the exact opposite in the United States. And you know what? I'm not even so sure if the DOD is I appreciate what's going on. But as far as the United States go, you know, is it just more smoke and mirrors as opposed to Peru, Argentina, Chile and Brazil? Where, no, it's not smoke and mirrors. This is a very serious subject. It is. And they've been looking into quite a few um, incidents. And we're going to talk about one of them. But before we do that, you had mentioned something. And now it it escaped my mind. Do you remember what it was that you Uh, wanted to touch on? Yeah, shrimp boats. So the shrimp... Oh, those those are interesting. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah. The fresh seafood um, is uh, no, I, uh, um, I'm I'm not so sure. So yeah. before we go sideways here, trying to uh, uh, unscramble our brains, um, let's. Uh, you wanted to uh, talk about a program, or I mean, a uh, UFO event, or do you want to move on to? Maybe Machu Picchu. We've got. Well, I do want to touch on the Peru UFO office and the incident that they looked into back in 2001. The reason to why I asked you that question because I had to scroll through my notes to find the section. So I was looking for a little bit of conversation so there wasn't any dead air. (laughs) No dead air. Right. You can't do that on radio. So the (laughs) Peruvian UFO office is called the Department of Investigation of Anomalous Aerial Phenomena, also known as the DIFAA. And so this was originally created in 2001, first making the news with its chief investigator, Anthony Choi, began looking into the mysterious Chula Canas incident that happened in 2001. And pretty much here is how the story goes. On October 13th, 2000 in, 2001, hundreds of people observed eight spheres of red-orange light moving intelligently through the sky for over five hours. A couple of weeks later, someone caught video of a bright tear-shaped object about 800 feet long hovering near the city. A few minutes later, several others saw mysterious lights landing in the woods. It was the DIFAA's first officially documented UFO case. And besides looking into visits by ET to Latin America, the DIFAA will also work to educate the Peruvian public and dispel some common alien myths that are happening around the country. In 2013, the agency held an event where it dismissed claims that the famous Nazca lines were made by extraterrestrial beings. Mm-hmm. That sounds a little bit like Project Blue Book to me. Mm-hmm. But uh, see, here's <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, here's the thing: uh, Nazca is is big. First off, 
um, it, it, it's remote. Um, there are many, many tombs out there. There are pyramids out there. There are mounds that are 5,000 years old, 3,000 BC. Um, and so the culture has been there for a very, very, very long time. And when uh, the Nazca lines side of things uh, came out, we cannot, with the logic, uh, a logical way of looking at any of this, we cannot say that this was done from the ground. It, it just doesn't make any sense. It just defies logic, right? So, and, and you know, carving off the top of a mountaintop, and what are you doing, you know, with kilometers long straight lines that are huge or wide, and you can't really see what they're doing, and, and they're perfectly geometrical, um, unless you're from the air and you can see them from uh, from space, you can see them from Earth's orbit. So what what gives here? So to uh, to suggest something, if it wasn't us, then who was it? And are we going to go extraterrestrial? Well, we need to go and look at all of that. And then back in, I want to say it was 2017, 2018, uh, Gaia um, had... Uh, introduced the Nazca mummies. And I remember um, I, I was on coast and uh, the story started to break and uh, Jay Widener had gone down there. They did a bunch of uh, uh, videos and, and analysis of things. And Christina, I'm here to tell you, this blew up the internet. These images and the videos of these uh, three-fingered, right there you can see these three-fingered mummies, um, I'm talking about 10, 15, 20, 30 million views on these videos and images. And uh, we were all blown away. X-rays were done um, and, and how it was covered in this powder that you can see here. Um, how, how could this be? Right. And and it, it, it wasn't just one mummy. There was many of them. Um, and I've got uh, another image here. And here's the three toed feet. Um, and and so there was a lot of debunking that uh, uh, occurred has to occur. You've got to go back in. I mean, this is this is too this is too crazy. Right. And it's too good to be true. Um, there needs to be uh, a healthy amount of skepticism to come in and and analyze all of this. Now, I know that Gaia did DNA. Uh, there were other mummies uh, that were done. I have, uh, let me see here. Hold on for a second. Let me, uh, let me pull this down. How do I pull this down? You have to pull it down. Pull it down. There you go. Let me scan through this for a second. And um, there was um, x-rays uh, that were done. Uh, there were uh, smaller alien uh, mummy type bodies. Okay, let's uh, let's uh, bring this one up. So we have this, and you can see the X rays. You can see the spine. You can see the shape of the skull, um, and 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 look at the face here, and how the neck is. And you can look at uh, this one here. These, uh, it's just for me. I'm not so sure. Um, let me back up right here. Man, I'm giving away my secret stuff here. And so here's another shot. And, and so some of the uh, skeptics and debunkers had come out and said that these were put together with animal parts. And and when you look at uh, the x-rays uh, that were done, go ahead and pull this down, Christina. Um, the x-rays that were done, let me see here. I think I've got... Yeah, I mean, this this story definitely made its rounds. It blew up online and documentaries were made, movies were made as well. But at the end of the day, what was the final answer? Still don't have it. Um, I know that uh, I, I, I believe that uh, there's a there was a little bit of a battle that was going on where Peru wanted uh, to have possession of these, uh, the government, that they wanted to pursue their own DNA evidence, that materials were taken out of the country uh, for DNA testing here in the United States. And there was a legal battle there about taking stuff out of the country like this. And there are laws in place, which I totally understand. 
And I'm not speaking here as a legal expert on this or I have insight into uh, the wrangling that has been going on because I don't. And, and that has been going on behind the scenes. I do have um, friends in Peru. I've, uh, of course, I've got friends over at Gaia. And I keep getting uh, the same responses, whether it's from the different researchers in Peru, also part of the university system down there, and, and from Gaia that uh, the research continues and that there hasn't been any conclusions here. So now there were, again, people had stepped forward and said, I'm, I'm the guy that did this. I'm the guy. Well, there was never really any, any smoking gun on either side um, uh, taking this into a direction. So I, I find the images compelling. I found the video compelling. Um, so many of uh, people that I know personally quite well uh, were there to uh, observe. Um, and and look at the x-rays as they were done. Um, I, I, to say that they touched them maybe with surgical gloves, but they were there and they looked at these up close. And, and these are people that I respect that are saying, man, you have to see it for yourself. It doesn't look like People put their careers on the line to to go ahead and attempt to find the answers on if that mummy was actually alien or not. And like you had mentioned, no one really has the definitive answers just yet. But it seems, well, those in the live chat, what do you think? Do you think this is true or do you think it's a hoax? Cecil, thank you so much. It says, little something for the RV and ramen fund. Why oh can't it God. be like a ramen RV? I told you we're going to wrap it ramen. We're going to wrap it ramen. <laughs> we need to get, we, we, it's very simple. You take a ramen noodle pack. I would go with, I, would, I wouldn't do okay. anything from Costco. You get the authentic Japanese, the, like the stuff that I sent you, right? Yeah. Get that and take that to a wrapping, an automobile wrapping place and yeah. go, I want this on that. And they'll do it. And, and go full Japanese. Go full it looks Japanese. so tacky. Oh, man. So and, oh, South Korean, though. Uh, some pretty good ramen out of South Korea, too, as well. Ramen. So. All ramen is delicious. <laughs> I just, I know, and before, I know we're getting off sidetracked again because of food, but I just, yesterday, I made the best bok choy soup with ramen, like with noodles in it to make it into a ramen. What, best what is, what is bok soup choy? I've ever made. What is bok choy? I hear it all the time. What is it? Bok choy is a green, it's a leafy green vegetable. And it's like, it can be small or really, really big. It originates in Asia and it, it tastes so good. It's a little bit bitter, but once you cook it with soy sauce, it is so yummy. Okay. So can I have it without bok choy? Of course, but then it won't be called bok choy soup. Hey, hey, just call it soup. And and I'm good with it. Uh, seaweed, spinach, kale, cabbage. Cabbage is okay. Uh, or napa, yeah, also yeah. good. But Egg I know plant. I know people didn't come for the recipe show. They came for the mysteries of Peru. No, and maybe no, no. I will share my famous bok choy recipe at the end <laughs> of the show. You know, if for those that are interested, I will share the recipe because it's the best soup I've literally ever made. Next to my red lentil soup. Wow. So okay. good. But stop, stop. Don't go red lentil. Cusco. Let's go Cusco. All right. Take us there. Let's go. Well, Cusco, um, I will uh let me bring up uh, a shot of uh uh downtown Cusco. And this is uh what what is so mind blowing for me. Um oh I gotta I got it, man. Okay. Hang on, everybody. I wasn't quite ready to do this like this. Well, while but, you're doing that, Roger says, the mysteries of ramen. That should be our next Mystery to the History episode. Absolutely. Okay. So here we are. That's downtown Cusco, right? Nice. This is a very, very uh, famous alleyway slash street. But um, we are talking about a wall there that is, you know, a thousand years old. Or older, but mm -hmm. when you look at uh, f some funky little things here, right? Which is these aren't 
if you were going to build a wall like this, it's on both sides of the street, by the way, it's over here, it's over here. And there are other sections of this wall where the Aztecs uh, came in and uh, the Incas and, and built on top of this and tried to imitate it. Nah, I didn't, didn't pull that off. I've got more images. But look at this right here. Okay. Look, look, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sided square. Right? <laughs> and then yeah. you have to turn around. And it's not just this. That means this has to get cut right. This has to get cut right. That's got to get this, 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 this. And, and you go down the wall and you see examples of this craziness. Look at this, right? You see examples of this type of construction all the way down. Mm -hmm. How was this done? Now, this is, this is a wall in the city of Cusco. This goes on all over. And you have to ask yourself, look at the, look at this line here. You see the line, you see how wavy it is. Right? And and Marty s said it so well, and I was thinking that classic squishy rock block wall. You just you just want to squish it, and then it's it's not squishy at all. No, but it looks squishy. But, but maybe that's how it was built. <sighs> In that you can see the straight line come coming down the top, right? And then you see these, you know, this odd were the rocks as they were placed soft. Right? Were they soft? So they were squished together and then cooled down because maybe they were heated. I don't know. Maybe there's a chemical process that was added to this that made the rocks soft. And they, it, and they molded them together and compressed them together. That makes a lot of sense instead of somebody. I mean, can you imagine? Right? You're the... Um, you're the guy carving the rocks, and you got the crew leader coming in. Okay, this next one, 12 sides. You'd be like, dude, no, man. Not again. Are you kidding me? And and but that's that's the deal. To to inter you have to, if if you cut it as natural rock, you have to cut it, place it, see what's messed up, bring it back down, fix it, put it back up adjust a little more carving, pull it back down and, and fit it. You have to fit it custom to it. That's so labor intensive. It would take thousands of years to, to build this wall. Or was it something really simple? Was it the squishy marshmallow rock? Right? Right. It, am I making sense here? Am I going to woo? I don't think so. Now it's a process that we don't know anything about. Maybe, it was something simple, like they took bok choy, rubbed the bok choy leaves all over the rocks, and it and there's a chemical reaction. I'm not joking here. And there was some kind of chemical reaction that goes on uh, to soften the rock to allow this type of molding process uh, to take place. But this is just one shot. Okay, so pull this down for me, Christina. And uh, now let's 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 go to Crazy Town. Well, first, Christy, thank you so much. It says the common nodes are fascinating here and other ancient sites. It makes me think they had the ability to melt the rock and pour them like cement. The nodes are the key, but I don't know how yet. Yes. Okay. okay. I'm with you on that one, Christina. All right. So got the nod. Now this we are looking at here, uh, everybody. Again, thank you, Christy, and you're absolutely right. Because when you go and look at something like this, where we're talking about today in 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 a modern sense, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 ton stones that are five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 15 feet tall and across. Um, they have to have been moved. They have to get carved, and they have to be put into place. And as you can see here, they are perfect. Now, there's uh, another thing that I want to uh, bring up. Now, you can see here how crazy these angles are and how they're put into place. But this is something that will withstand everything, right? Everything, earthquakes, weather, storms, 
uh, nuclear blast, right? That uh, here we are so many, you know, a thousand years later, and they are as they were built. I've got some shots of the nodes here in a second. But as if this wasn't crazy enough, then you go to something like this. Insane. Just take a look at, now th this is a very famous rock and it's big. And here we are. Now let's look at the bottom here. And this is one of the nodes that Christy was talking about. There's another one here. There's one here, 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 right? And could, and I, I mentioned this the other night on Fade to Black. Maybe, I'm just saying that it, maybe they were poured or maybe they were soft to a point and that this is where the squishy part came out like toothpaste out of a tube and then you just whoop, cut it off, right? You know, I had originally thought when I looked at these over the years that these were ways to grab the rocks or maybe position it, you know, with a crane or some kind of device came in and ropes and they somehow used these and latched down to, I, you know, I, we've all wondered uh, what these are for, but they look so organic to me that maybe that is overflow and residue from a softer compound. And maybe these were indeed poured. I don't know, but what were these little bumps? And they're all over these walls, right? Always on the bottoms of the stones. You don't see it on the top. See it on the bottom. There's one here that's uh, been broken off. There's another one right here. Um, you know, and and how do you explain this type of uh, construction? And and why would you do it? There are some people that believe that the Incas were attempting to create the walls to look like corn. Ah, okay. Stop. Stop right there. Pull this down. Now let's let's talk a little Inca here. Okay, let's 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 go Inca, everybody, because because this is Inca on the top. This is a culture that we don't know who built it. The Inca came in later and built on top of the existing walls. Okay, now that's what you see. You just brought up the corn, right? You can kind of see it here. Right. But that's here. This is new. This is new. And this is also simple. And now you come down here and this is the culture that was there uh, hundreds, if not a thousand years before the Incas arrived. And the Incas trying to do a little replication of, you know, <laughs> now this was probably carved right now. You see the nodes here, right? There's a no see, see the nodes. You don't see this here. These are carved. These this is this is quarried and carved and placed. Very simple. Uh, it's cool. It's it, it, you know, but it's not this which is below it. Okay, you can pull this down. And I have um, uh, one of uh, my other favorite images. Look at that. Okay, now that one's crazy. It is. Now this is Inca on the top. And this is the culture before the Inca arrived down here on the bottom. And you can see the Inca tried to replicate it. You know, they were added to the wall and tried to duplicate it. But it's nothing like this down here. I look at the size of this stone. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven sides. Once again, this one, one, two, three, four, five, six sides here. It just, and, just, and each and each rock is a few tons. Not few, 10, 15, 40, <laughs> yeah. 30, 40, 50. This, this, this here, you know, you're talking 50, maybe a hundred ton stone. You know, that's it's that's not small. And now, uh, one other comment about Cusco. I, uh, you can pull this down. Um, I've, I think I have one other image. Uh, yeah, it's this one here. Go ahead and pull this one up. I mean, why? That's somebody showing off right there, right? That's somebody showing off. But isn't, look at this, this, this dude here, this is what catches your eye, right? What's, what's going on with this? That's, that's nuts to me. It's, it's elegant. And There's no simple explanation for an ancient culture to create something so complex for really no reason. 
no written unless there was a reason right right Uh, to withstand earthquakes why would they know about that but here's um here's uh the uh for me like if you get into the the crazy and fantastical stuff with this um there doesn't appear any evidence of war of invasion of warring cultures these weren't defensive walls. It's not a wall to a city. So what? why would you, as the leader of this culture, um, spend all of your resources, your manpower, your food, everything, on building these extraordinarily huge walls with these megalithic stones that came from quarries, Christina, 40, 50 miles away, not over flat land, mountains, right? Hills. And then you've got to get these stones over the hills, over the hills and far away, right? Over the hills to this to this site where it apparently it doesn't really serve a purpose. So you are, as a leader of this culture, I'm not an anthropologist, But I do think a little bit logically here where you have to um, tell your people a pretty good story, right? We're going to build these walls for the next couple of hundred years. That's all we're going to do. And this is why. And then you as a people have to go, okay, makes sense. You have to be convinced, persuaded to to do so. Me and my grandsons and my sons are going to do this forever for you because that's a pretty good idea what what was the re, what was the purpose for this and it doesn't make any sense to me so um i don't know i don't know I'm, I'm glad that they're here they're beautiful and we can just you know step back and and again ponder and wonder uh what the reasons were for this how they got it done um how were these carvings done uh, were they poured was it soft uh, were they levitating these things? And and listen, before uh, <laughs> before I go all crazy town and, you know, levitation, did they have Merlin? What was going on? Did they have sound energy with Annie Gravitic? I don't know. But we're talking about a culture that had uh, no access to anything advanced. So how did it get cored? How did it get moved? How did it get set, and what was the reason why? And we don't have answers for any of it. Love, Peru. It makes me want to get a plane and go there right now. And you have just extreme climates all across the country. You have literally everything. And seriously, the the thousand varieties of potatoes really catches me. (laughs) Forget the rocks. It's the potatoes. But there is one story. Because you know, Jimmy, you know, when we talked about the Bridgewater Triangle, I was infatuated with puck wedgies. Mm-hmm. These, these super not cute little gremlins, goblin things with the cutest name ever. And then I came across a story somewhat slightly kind of similar in Peru called the Muki. And it seems that across countries, across states in the United States, we're consistently getting stories of these goblins, these gnomes, these dwarf-like creatures that are always angry, vicious, and trickster as well. So this story is rather interesting. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen of what some people think these goblin-like creatures look like. Here it is. I don't, I wouldn't want to deal with one. Thank you by the way that one is drawn out. But according to oral tradition, the Muki is no more than two feet in height, yet it's very muscular and with a very deep voice. His skin is described as ghostly pale with long blonde hair framing dazzling eyes that reflect the light like the metals in the mines 
he inhabits. They dress in traditional mining garb, which varies from era to era. According to legend, he used to roam the darkness wearing a poncho and carrying a lantern. But nowadays, he prefers modern mining clothes with <laughs> boots and a flashlight. His feet are said to be abnormally large, resulting in a strange duck-like waddle. One common theme in this lore is the tendency for the creature to make deals with the miners. And this creature is said to trade valuable mining knowledge to help in exchange for luxuries such as alcohol or coca leaves. However, this little goblin plays the part of a trickster or demon, and this de these deals can backfire badly for miners who are greedy and that don't trust these goblins. So what's very interesting about the Muki is that they love women and young girls. So some very greedy men would trade these females for mining knowledge so that they would know where the gold and silver veins are. And these uh, goblins would take these girls deep into the mountains, never to be seen again. Wow. So the so Wookie, Mookie, what are they called? Mookie. So the Mookie show up to the miners and go, how much for the women? We want the, you want the gold? How much for the little girls? It seems that way, and it's Crazy. pretty mortifying. And this is a, a once again an oral tradition that has been has been passed on for centuries. No, probably not that long. A little bit less than that. Probably about a century, where you are dealing with people that want to beat poverty, that want to go ahead and, and mine gold and si silver, and they will do anything to achieve those riches. And Oh, I feel bad for those girls. Now, this this is a legend, but it's believed that there have been some people that have encountered these little gnome-like creatures and lived to tell the tale. But this is a consistent story across the globe. So it makes you question, is it really just a legend? No, it's not a legend. It's people living in the inner earth, man. You're down there mining and they show up and yeah, <laughs> I don't know, but I, I, I would not, uh, I would not be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. So no. there you go. now I know everybody's a little shocked that, that I would go too many, too many stories about fairies and, and leprechauns and what are they called? Mookie? Muki. Muki. Maybe I'm saying it wrong, but it's M U K I. Yeah, sounds Muki ish to me. <laughs> too, many, too many of these stories that, that have gone on, uh, you know, gnomes and and elves. It, 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 I'm okay with that. They're, it, it, in different parts of the world, they have a different word uh, for it. Pukwudgie. Yeah, a Pukwudgie. There you go. Uh, different word. Same, same legend, same story. And uh, it's it, it all the way up through uh, modern times. So, and apparently the Mookie likes wearing mining helmets and carrying flashlights now. So that, that tells me that it's, it's, it's a pretty modern, uh, pretty modern story there. I just think that there's something to it. Uh, I, I don't know what it is, but there is, can we go? Um, I'm looking at the clock uh, before we run out of time. Could we do high America? Let's go for it. I mean, um, the first time, uh, go ahead and I'm sure you've got an image. Uh, I do. You, I'm about to share my screen. The first time that I had heard the story about high well, now, you know, it's been many, many years. What happened? What? Nothing. I have to fix that. Hold on. See, <laughs> see it, I was doing a voiceover. I was going to do a voiceover. When I had first heard the stories um, about this, now, since then, um, there it is. It's about, uh, I think it's, uh, 23 feet, 24 feet square. Um, nobody really knows, uh, what is going on here, uh, with this, that it was maybe a project that was started and then, uh, was unfinished and was abandoned. Don't know. Um, but, uh, there's one thing, oh, I don't have a pointer here. 
that doorway looks suspiciously like a Gobekli Tepe tea pillar. I'm just saying. It does. I'm just saying. Now, if we go with the legend uh, uh, about about this, um, is that uh, an Incan uh, priest uh, went up uh, this uh, gold amulet, you know, like Indiana Jones falls out of the sky. Um, he collects it. He goes up the, to the doorway. It fits into the, the hole that is there. Uh, this doorway enters. Priest goes in, disappears, right? And and that's that's part of uh, the, the Hayamarca legend. I have actually, I'm not, I swear, I'm not making this up. I got a handful of friends that uh, are not connected, but I have a handful of friends that have gone down and, and went up to the doorway. And a couple of them have said they've seen people disappear. That they've seen people go up and f- now I'm, I haven't been there, um, but they do call it the gate of the gods. Um, it wasn't even discovered. Here's the crazy part. It wasn't discovered until the the 1990s, right? It was it was up there this entire time, and nobody had ever seen it. So nobody really knows uh, anything about it. Nobody knows how it was carved, who did it, when, where, why, what the purpose was. Don't know. Again, the Incan culture uh, has no written records of anything, so we don't know. We only have this. And then, of course, the legend that goes along with it, with this this Incan priest that uh, was gifted the, the key uh, to unlock this thing, and it was unlocked. Uh, the door opened. He went in, didn't come out, door closed, uh, but it's been unlocked ever since, and it's a portal to somewhere. Would you, Christina, so... Somebody from Peru comes up and goes, okay, here are the secret words. Practice them and then go up to the door and repeat them. Do you do it? Probably. <laughs> I believe you too. I do. I believe you. I, be- I, I, I honestly believe you. So, you know, I probably would too. I probably would too. But it, it, it's certainly interesting. It's certainly interesting. Yeah, it is. Um, it's it's a really fascinating story. First found in 1996, and it really just captured everyone's attention after that. Yeah, and they call uh, they do call the door if you uh, jump around and, and different researchers uh, that that I talk to about uh, the gate of, of the gods. I've heard it repeated so many times. Way before Gobekli Tepe was on the scene that it was a T-shaped door. It's got a T-shaped door. You hear this repeated over and over again. And when I look at it now, I just think of Gobekli Tepe. You know, there's something, you, it looks like you could take a Gobekli Tepe T-pillar and just slide it in. Yeah, it's insane. And Christy says, there's a dude that says he went through a portal and opens by humming a sound. He said our universe was made by the inhabitants on the other side during an experiment. They sent him back. Weird, right? That yeah. is very weird. And I've heard a story similar to that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've talked to a couple of people that have allegedly witnessed this going down. So, you know, I, I don't know. So it's a humming sound. So you have to hum. Hmm, okay. In Father Ted, they asked that question. What's your favorite humming sound? Is it mmm or is it mmm? <laughs> oh, Christina. It's one of my favorite episodes. Christina, I'm just going to let you know, um, I've got some computer issues and you're jittering on my end. Are you okay? okay? Yeah, but um, let's go ahead and end today's show. Uh, I do want to say Thank you to absolutely everyone that watched this live Mysteries of Peru. Which story was your absolute favorite? Mine, of course, were these gnome-like creatures. The 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 Wookie. What about you? The Wookie. No. I, I am uh, the Mookie. I uh, we didn't even get to Machu Picchu, but I, I'm gonna say uh, Cusco and and the walls. 
that that surround that city are, are just amazing. And also, there's a tunnel complex, uh, Cusco, with uh, a temple that is in the center. Um, and there's a lot of uh, a craziness behind that, too, as well. So for me, uh, it, it is Cusco, but you've got uh, the Nazca lines. It's just incredible. Uh, you've got the Nazca mummies. Uh, and again, the Atacama alien, which is not that far from there. And then you've got Lake Titicaca and Puma Punku. Yeah, all of I mean, yeah. you can't go wrong. It's such an amazing country. And I would take a plane in a heartbeat to go over there. Jimmy, thank you so much for being on the show today. We will catch you next Thursday. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I've got computer issues. I don't I don't know what's going on here. So all right, well, I'll I, catch I you in a few. Everybody. Behave and be well. Thank you once again to absolutely everyone that watched this show live. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies.